Rafe Kelly, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I have been fascinated by your website, by your work. Um, I'm, I'm partly interested in all the things that we disagree about, but I think I'd rather focus on where we can, you know, find commonalities at least of, of understanding. Um, and you are all about sort of how the human being was meant to move. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so let's let's start. You know, you have a sort of a great sort of backstory, right? Of, of how you got into this. You it seemed like you were struggling as a child. Can you talk a little bit about what who you were and and what happened. Yeah. Um, so my father actually also has ADHD and dyslexia, and I also had that. And um, we uh, so I had a you know a very privileged upbringing in certain ways and a very uh, underprivileged upbringing in other ways. My my family homesteaded in the Sedge Valley in 1920, and uh, my uh, great grandfather uh, started the uh, shake mill. It was kind of the central central you know uh, economic hub in that area. And where is that? Uh, Sedge County is uh, it's the second most most northwestern county in the continental. U.S. right in the fifty states. Um, state is that? No, Washington State. So yeah, so, so yeah, and so yeah, so back in nineteen twenty, and then um, my dad was raised on that land, and he, you know, uh, really struggled in school, and then uh, he he kind of turned the land from a a a, a cattle ranch to uh, I guess a hippie hub, right? He's a world famous uh, natural builder um, and has built these crazy houses. So he built all these amazing houses and he um, Wait, planted like. Are you talking about Sunray Kelly? Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> I, I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Okay. I'm just, my brain just totally did a backflip. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my dad. So I was Sunray's son, right? Um, and uh, and so when I when I got to school and I was not uh, you know I was having a lot of struggles with school um, it, that was hard for my dad to see because he'd gone through it and he you know he was very interested in sort of getting away from the system as it was and wanting to live a lifestyle that was back to the land and didn't um, you know he, he wanted to throw off the shackles of. Uh, of contemporary Western culture. So there's a big struggle between him and my mom about whether I should even continue in school. He wanted to take me out of school completely. Um, and that he, he, I think it was hard for him emotionally to watch me go through the same struggles that he'd had. Mm. Um, so I was fighting a lot in school. I was, you know, uh, getting in a lot of trouble. And, you know, my, my dad kind of separated from me emotionally, kind of couldn't handle it. So he became very neglectful. And then when I was eight years old, I was lucky enough to have a mentor who came into my life and started babysitting me a lot first. His name was Gopal. And then he, uh, my mom, after third grade, my mom had petitioned to get me moved to the next grade every year since uh, first grade, second grade, and then third grade, they said, you know, no, he's going to have to be held back. Um, but my mom could see that even though I tested as if I had not made any progress, I was actually like occasionally reading novels at home and you know, she knew I was bright, but she just, you know, it wasn't showing up on the tests. So, so they decided to homeschool me and eventually Gopal ended up essentially taking over my education and homeschooling me most of the time. Uh, and he, he did a lot of rough and tumble play with me, just something that I really craved from my dad and my dad and I used to have a really good connection with that. Um, but my dad wasn't very available for it. And so Gopal gave that to me and that was really, really valuable and really healing for me. And then we only did two hours of schoolwork a day and that was enough for me. And then I spent the rest of the time sort of wandering around in the woods. And so I built a lot of forts and jumped and climbed. And I had older cousins who were all mountain bikers and, and their friends who built really amazing mountain biking areas. And I used to run and jump and climb through those areas as well. So that was kind of, um, yeah, part of the story. And then I started martial arts when I was very young. I was six years old. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I'm, I mean, I'm just, you know, um, I'm curious. It's like what you were thinking at this time, 
right? Like you told the story from the perspective of your dad and your mom and maybe the school teachers. Like, did you think that there was something wrong with you? I mean, you were, you know, you you must have been getting so many different messages about what it means to be a successful human being. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was just, I, I lived in a strange little world because uh, I spent a lot of time in the alternative hippie culture, right? So like, mm, I think it was second grade, second grade, I believe. Um, we just left and went on a a giant bus tour of the Southwest. Uh, and we went down to protest. <laughs> um, there was a, there was a nuclear tester happening at a reservation in Nevada. And we went down there and we were part of the protests or my dad was part of the protests. And so we were at this kind of, it was kind of like a hippie festival happening on the side of this as all these people came to protest. And so there were like vendors and stuff set up, you know, and my mom would just hang out with us during the day while my dad was was there protesting and getting arrested every day. Getting <laughs> put in a pen and you know, covering himself in mud so the police wouldn't want to speak to him and climbing out of the pen and climbing from the men's pen into the women's pen and driving the cops crazy. Um, and, you know, so my dad, my dad, I guess, was, you know, the message from him was pretty clear that, like, he didn't, you know, he didn't perceive the, the the school system as being an important thing to be prioritized. <laughs> Whereas my mom was you know, much more like, you know, you have to go through the standard and, and, and become competent. Um, and I knew, I think I had a sense that I was very bright and, you know, and I was told that by lots of people from a young age that I was very perceptive. And, you know, my mom tells stories about me like, you know, running ahead on hikes when I was little and she'd find me just chatting with some random person talking about the nature of God, you know, just weird stuff. Um, and so I had a perception that I had like exceptional intellectual abilities. And at the same time I was being told and I was frustrated and having really bad experiences at school. Um, I remember in first grade, they, we had a math book and, and I, I read ahead in the math book and I believe I like comprehended uh, multiplication and division. And I ran up into my parents' bedroom and I was like, hey, I, you know, I can do this. And then I remember going back to school and having to do rote memorization. And I said, you know, three plus two equals five, three plus two equals five over and over again. And uh, I remember it was like a, a black curtain would come down in the middle, in my mind. Like I would become very frustrated and it was like, I just couldn't, I couldn't see it anymore. You know, it was like the, the neurons that allowed three plus two equal five just disappeared, you know? Um, and that was very frustrating, you know? Uh, and I was very angry. Um, well, it's, it sounds so, like um, that even then, like a, a big piece of the puzzle for you was some, something around freedom, right? Like the freedom to explore on your own. I don't, you know, I don't know where you were in your house when you were, you know, reading or reading the math book, but like, I can just imagine you sitting in a chair at a desk for you know seven six or seven out of the eight hours a day of school and that just shutting you down yeah i mean there was something about the way that the information was being given to us that was really not working for me right but i was also very curious i was very hungry for information i loved to to learn things you know, and so I remember, I think it was in, maybe it was in third grade, and they had these really remedial books that were very boring, and, and I just wasn't motivated. I, I think that, <laughs> uh, if you want to get inside my psychology a little bit, I think one of the things that's, that's relatively unique about me is that I, I'm, I have high intrinsic motivation and a very poor response to extrinsic motivators. <laughs> so I don't, I don't care that much what what carrot people dangle in front of me. And so when I was, there were, I think in third grade, there was a pumpkin carving contest, right? And, you know, we we're supposed to make the, the scariest pumpkin. And I just murdered this pumpkin because I was angry. Like I didn't, I didn't try to do anything. I wasn't trying to win. I was just, just hacking at this pumpkin and just carving it in this terrible, horrific shape because it was a way to express how angry I was. Um, and, then my pumpkin won and I was shocked because I hadn't been trying to do the, the 
task at all, right? And and it didn't really, it was like, I didn't care about gold stars. I didn't care about anything that, that the, the schooling system wanted me to do. Um, but like I was intensely interested at that time in uh, tropical rainforests and the animals that live there. So my mom bought me a book that was like a sixth grade level book about the tropical rainforest. And so when there was reading time, if she brought that book there, I would read. Mm -hmm. But if I had to read Sea Spot Run, I just wouldn't. Uh -huh. uh, and I, not only would I not do it, I would be intensely angry that I was being asked to do it. So, um... I mean, I want to, you know, continue with your, with your story, yeah, yeah. but I, but I'm, I'm curious, like, what, like, if you were like this, you know, Biden calls you up and said, Hey, I want you to be the secretary of education. Okay. <laughs> well, what would you, what would you do to like make school better? What would I do to make school better? I mean, I don't think that I'd be the best secretary of education because I mean, I have some kind of insight because because it didn't work for me. So I can point, it, point out some of the failures in the system. But I think my psychology is really unique. Like I, I think that I'm, I'm not a good model for other people's psychology. And so, so what works for me won't necessarily be what works for everybody else. I think for folks like me, and there's I think particularly more young boys who have psychologies like me, but not only, not only boys, um, they're, there really needs to be an emphasis on physical development, right? There, there has to be a physical culture to burn, to, to essentially burn through some of the energy before you can get them to sit down. Like your kids shouldn't be asked to sit down before they're intensely physical. And, and this is something that I think, you know, based on the research that I've done on play and learning and motor learning, I think motor learning in general is a good, is, is very important for people to understand for pedagogy because essentially everything boils down to motor skills and, and cognitive skills are in some ways sort of, uh, what, what we do by thinking in a lot of ways is to model motor actions in a cognitive space. And so when we have better motor, when we have better understanding of motor processes, we actually have a better understanding of cognition as well. Um, and so if you look at motor learning theory and then learning theory in general, you see that. So can you explain what motor learning theory is for, for people who've sure. never heard the term before? So motor just refers to movement actions, right? And learning okay. theory of how we learn, you know, and then, uh, so this really came out, the, the field really developed uh, in, I believe it was World War II. And it developed because you had all of these high skilled workers who disappeared and all these, it may have been World War I too. It's one, it may, actually may have been World War I, but it was one of those two world wars where you lost a lot of the people who were working in factories and you had to replace them and you had to replace them very quickly. And so the governments, uh, you know, our government, the Russian government spent a bunch of money to try to get scientists to look at how we could improve the speed at which someone could learn a new motor skill. And back then, you know, when you took on a new factory job, you know, it wasn't just typing on a computer, you actually had motor skills that you had to apply in order to, uh, to be able to accomplish that job. So whether you're Rosie the Riveter or whatever it is, that was a, that was a set of motor skills. So they essentially looked at like, well, what are the conditions under which people acquire new motor skills really quickly? And that's where the, the, the theory of motor learning came. And so you have, uh, you had a, a kind of theory of how we learn that pre-existed that um, the, is generally called schema theory, um, if I remember correctly. But the, the basic idea is that, well, this, is a, this is a fun idea to explore. This is something that I learned from John Verveke to a degree, but I think it's a really interesting idea. But we, we look at the world through metaphor, right? We don't we frequently don't understand to, to just what degree uh, the way that we think about things is actually dependent upon metaphors. And those metaphors generally root down into the physical. So if you think about what I just said, you can see it. Understand means to stand under something, right? Mm -hmm. And meta means over. 
and um, and root down, <laughs> root down, right? All, all, we're constantly we're constantly referencing this this motor language because it's the first you know interface we have with the world, and, huh. and language comes from the word for tongue. Yeah, exactly. We're so constantly you can't stop now, right? <laughs> once, yeah. once you see yeah. it, yeah, it's 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 huge. So. Um, <laughs> Where was it going with that? So uh, I got a little lost there. We're, we're talking about um, so the motor learning. Metaphor that we learn through metaphor. We see the world through metaphor. Uh, yes. Okay. So this is this is the central point that I wanted to make, which is essentially our, our most powerful technologies at a given time tend to have a real power in our minds as metaphors. And they can be very powerful for us, but they also can become misleading. So when Descartes develops, you know, essentially the, the rational materialist model of how we look at the world, he ends up with a clockwork universe, right? And there's a reason why he conceptualizes the universe as a clock. It's because that's the most profound, complex technology that he had available to him to conceive the world. And so as we then go into the Industrial Revolution and we develop, go into the development of physical pedagogy as um, as you know, the, the cultivation of human beings, that pedagogy is is essentially around the machine, and then the 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 schooling system is also essentially a a factory process that is developed. You know, it's 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 code, right? To use an analogy, it, it's is sort of borrowed from factories. And then children are kind of treated as products that are being molded into a specific shape to become cogs in this giant machine of society. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're trapped within this analogy of the human being as a machine. And then as computers come up, we start to think of the mind as a computer. Um, and in some ways a body is like a machine, right? In some ways a mind is like a computer. And, but then a lot of ways it's not, and we get trapped in this thinking. So when we think about, uh, or as the way that we tended to conceptualize movement is that we had motor programs, which are like software programs in your brain. And you have kind of like the central governor of your brain, which pushes a button and then the, the, the body outputs a motor program. And so when you're learning a skill, the idea was that what you're doing is essentially like installing a motor program. And uh, the kind of the, the godfather, you know, largest figure in the field of, of motor learning is this uh, Russian uh, scientist, Nikolai Bernstein. And what he developed was an understanding that, that this was a, uh, this was a very poor way to understand the human body. So the, so there's two central insights behind that. One is what he called the, um, the, the degrees of freedom problem, and the other is the context condition variability problem. Uh, but the degrees of freedom problem is essentially that if you look at any machine, it's largely made up of things that have one degree of freedom, right? So when you have a, a hinge on a door, it has a single degree of freedom. It can move this way, it can move backwards or forwards, but it cannot move up and down. It can only move backwards or forwards. A ball bearing has three degrees of freedom, right? It can move in any direction, okay? And, uh, You, it's very, very difficult to control a ball bearing, right? If you just have it in one place. So if you put that on your hand and you try to control it, it's, it's impossible. Well, your body is made up of things that have many, many degrees of freedom. Everything in your body has many, many degrees of freedom. Uh, if you think about what a, a bone and a muscle is, right? A bone is this stiff element, though it actually has flex in it. Um, it's not completely stiff. And it's connected to these these jelly ropes. So imagine taking uh, like a broomstick and having a soft attachment because the joints are not hard attachments, they're soft attachments that attaches it to your stomach. And then you have a series of rubber bands and you have to control that broomstick with those rubber bands. Right? <laughs> you can imagine how, how difficult it would be to create a, um, a, a strong control. So you, so you cannot have a central control mechanism that controls that. You have to have feedback loops, right? So you have to have intelligence at the local level. 
And so that's what you have. You have goal guide tendon apparatus and you have stretch receptors and you have all these things that are constantly feeding information. And then you have layers of control so that when your, when your foot hits the ground and you walk, um, you have reflexive control factors that are happening in the, the local muscles basically and the tissues. And then they just goes up to the joint level of control and the spinal level of control and then the, the, the cognitive level of control. Um, it's almost like you're saying that the whatever we want to call it, the mind is not just in the head; it's distributed through the entire body. Yes, that that is uh, that is one one thing that comes out of this line of research for sure. And so, so yeah, so so that that's um, so when we understand how. We, Essentially, what comes out of that research, why it becomes important in understanding and learning in a more general sense, is that the better way to conceive of a human being is not like a machine, but like an ecology, right? It's a system of systems, and they have sort of, uh, uh, there's a dynamic aspect to the way these things play, where um, small inputs can have large effects, and large inputs can have relatively small inputs on the system, right? And and the system self-organizes, right? Children are self-organizing learning machines. Hmm. And so as a coach, my, my role is not to install programs in my students. My role is to help direct and facilitate their inherent learning capacities. Hmm. So if, so what, what, where the system failed me in some sense was that my, my learning style turned out to be quite robust, taken out of the inputs that they were given me, but the inputs they were given me were actually inhibiting my own inherent learning style. And um, I don't know how universal that is. Uh, if you look at Peter Gray's work, he, he tends to believe um, that essentially everybody would learn better given a um, learning environment like I had post third grade. Uh -huh. uh, you know, this is how Hunter for our drugs will learn. We, I mean, there, there's, a, so there's so many layers to questions like these that get really interesting because there's also, you know, there's also this, this underlying sort of uh, Calvinist ethic maybe uh, maybe maybe it's Calvinism. Uh, sometimes we say Christian when we talk about these things, but Christianity is such a big, big thing. And 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 often when we think about what Christianity has done wrong, we're really thinking about something very, very specific to a specific time period, a specific branch of Christianity. But but um, but you know, Calvinism has this idea. I believe it's Calvinism, which has this idea of total depravity. Right? Essentially, human beings are. Are, are utterly enmeshed in sin. And the only way that we can escape sin is through dedication to Christ, right? And that gave rise, I believe, to a parenting style and a raising children style that was really based around the idea of breaking the will of the child and forcing them to essentially uh, get rid of what is natural in them, right? So that they can progress towards the angels. And this is also sort of was baked in, I think, into the, the beginning of our educational system, right? It's kind of part of the DNA of our educational system to a degree. Well, it's and so the, the, the code of, of our government, it's, you know, like people, you know, people won't police themselves. You know, we need to elect strong people to tell us what to do. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's a very sort of an, anti-anarchic view. that There has to be this top-down control. Yeah. And and that we don't trust the goal, the, the Golgi body of individuals. We just trust the head, the, the head of state. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, many, I mean, that kind of drives me to like the debate between Hobbes and Rousseau and, and stuff like that. But um, that that model was that that the inherent drives of the human being were something to be gotten away from, right, rather than something to be worked with, and. So, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. That was the, this was the idea for, for a long time. And, you know, that's an idea where 
the internal systems, the intrinsic drives are not respected at all as ways in which we can uh, drive someone towards uh, a learning goal, let's say. Mm -hmm. And what's missed in that, and I don't think there's actually, I don't think that that's completely wrong, right? But what's missed in that is that there's actually an inherent love of learning and children have a deep seated drive to acquire the cultural toolkit around them in order to become competent adults. Children inherently want to become competent adults and they model what's happening around them. So in hunter forger populations, you see this, that, that essentially kids look up to and recognize the people who are models for, for becoming an effective adult that looks kind of like them. So girls prefer female role models and boys prefer male role models generally. And maybe, you know, if there's some sort of different niches in society, you might notice that you have more similarity to a hunter versus a shaman or vice versa. And then you kind of select that person as the person that you model. And then you play games based on that, right? So, so my, my children, my daughters, you know, they play house a lot. You know, they, 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 they act out being mothers and being wives, you know? And my son acts out being a monster and a warrior. Um, and that's, that's, that's what he chooses to model himself after you know, a ninja and a Viking and a, whatever it is. And, and so children are doing that. They're doing it all the time. So in a hunter for us civilization, like little boys generally, what well, usually it's bow and arrows in most of the contemporary hunter for civilization, but little boys are absolutely fascinated by bow and arrows and want to start shooting them as soon as they can get their hands on them. And they teach themselves by shooting at small things like lizards. And then they just slowly progress to the point where their shooting is strong enough and they're physically strong enough to shoot an arrow at a, at a full-size prey item, right? And so the, the, the activities of, of play sort of just naturally emergently become the skills of adulthood. And children have this inherent capacity. Uh, Peter Gray cites in his book, um, Free to Learn, this research that was done on children in India, I believe, and I think in like Indian slums, where they took computers, they, they created these, they had essentially computer stations, and they dropped them in the in the slums, and they just made it relatively easy for kids to sort of input into them. And these kids educated themselves on how to utilize the internet and were like, had emails and we're starting to interface with the web and watch videos and make things like very quickly. I don't remember the exact timeline, but the point was that, that, that this, this thing was in their environment all of a sudden, and it had an inherent intrigue for them. And then as they explored that thing, they discovered that it gave them powers that were fascinating to them. And so they just educated themselves. And so you have this intrinsic capacity to attain knowledge. And this is true um, also, you know, this is true physically, right? If, if you put a trampoline outside, kids will jump on it and they will explore ways of moving in, in, in a variety of ways that will essentially scale itself in some ways inherently into acrobatics. Um, if there's trees around, kids will climb trees and they will get strong at, at things that, that are engaged in, in, in climbing trees. So we have a, an inherent um, educational system. So as a coach, my, I believe that, that coaches um, should take the Hippocratic oath. First, do no harm, right? We should come to our teaching with a recognition that, that the, the student has an inherent intelligence and capacity for self-organization that allows them to accomplish essentially whatever we would help them accomplish on their own, right? And we shouldn't overrate our own, our own influence in that. And then we should be asking, how can I uh, facilitate that? And if necessary, direct it in a way that's going to be relevant to learning goals that are important in, in my role as their teacher, right? Um, and I think that the same would be true of, of uh, of working in the schooling system, 
right? It, it should be it should be rooted in a understanding that the child has an inherent drive to educate themselves and that a lot of what we attribute to the schooling system is actually something that the kids would probably accomplish on their own uh, without school. And so the, the, the justification for teaching should always be that, um, that by engaging in this intervention, I can speed up or improve that process or at least um, improve the child's experience, right? At least they could enjoy the experience. And if you're doing something that, that, that um, you know, you should be very careful and aware that actually you can injure the child's inherent self-organization and educational drive through, uh, through applying the wrong intervention. Yeah, that's, that's so cool because I'm, you know, I'm a coach around people's health and behaviors and, and what occurs to me as you say, as you speak is like the main thing I'm doing is curating signal and noise for them. And of course, there's a difference between, you know, a child who has not been sullied by a school system that has told them, no, don't be interested in this, be interested in that. No, don't move around, sit. Uh, no, you've got to learn this and I'm not going to tell you why, <laughs> you know, just mm -hmm. because. Um, and, an, you know, an adult who is trying to unlearn a whole bunch of behaviors. Um, but, you know, just that idea that like what, what I'm what I'm there to do, if we, based on my experience of having worked with lots of people, is that there's there's noise and there's signal. And so I can help you sort of more efficiently and more fully embody who you're going to become by helping you um, deal with feedback more appropriately. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's a really beautiful uh, insight. You know, I'm reading this book right now, uh, The Secret of Our Success by uh, Joe Heinrich. And it's essentially a book about how cultural evolution is um, sort of the largest driver of human success. That it's not, that humans don't actually stand out from other apes um, as being massively smarter. Um, that the size of our brains isn't really to allow us to have just pure processing power or you know extraordinary problem solving ability that other apes don't have. It's more that it allows us to store cultural information and it's through the process of cultural uh, of enculturation that we acquire skills that are so far beyond any other animal. And one of the things he was talking about there is that uh, human children are far more attuned to the attention that adults pay to things than um, than other animals are, right? So essentially, uh, one way to think about it is that there's a lot more um, complexity that a, that a human child is sort of exposed to. There's more uh, there's more potential for noise in the system than there is for an ape or a wolf, and that we're attuned to look for guides through the chaos towards the signal, mm. right? And then becoming good at, at guiding someone to what's salient is really valuable. And, uh, and also having empathy to recognize what is salient for somebody else and not necessarily uh, just what's salient to you. Mm. Well, as you say that, that's kind of terrifying in a world that we live in now where so many people are addicted to screens. <laughs> And little kids are looking at what the adults are looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we're, I'm battling with that myself in my own life, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm overly addicted to my screen and my kids are modeling that behavior. Uh, we've had to, uh, we've had, because of the pandemic, we've had to go to an online schooling system. So we wouldn't have given them devices at this stage of their life, except that it's the only way for them to access school. Mm -hmm. um, so they have uh, they have their 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 iPads now, and and they get to watch uh, like TV shows and play video games as part of their education. Um, you know, the school assigns them to watch an educational thing, but it's a very thin line between the educational and the straight entertainment. And so they'll, they will watch, you know, they'll, they'll try to sneak in more extra TV time, basically, or extra video game time. 
and I'm sort of having to to uh, to say, hey, is this really for school? Um, you know, hey, why don't you go play outside for a while instead? And and you know, and then sometimes they come back to me, well, then you're on your screen. Like, why why can't I be on the screen? Right. All right. And uh, so yeah, they're 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 observing that the adults around them interface with their screens a lot of the time, and that this you know this is rewarding for them in some way, you know, because we know that a lot of the technologies that we interface with are essentially designed to manipulate our dopamine system to make them addictive. Um, so once a kid gets on it, they're they're getting that dopamine system hijacked too. Um, and then also it's like, well, what is the more, what is the powerful technology? What's the bow and arrow, right? Like clearly the, the amount of attention that adults pay to their, their devices uh, is a very strong signal to a child that this is highly salient in the landscape of becoming a competent adult. Mm. Uh, so we, you have a couple different um, signals there to the child that are can very easily um, start manipulating behavior. And I mean, in general, I'm I'm sure you've come across this theory that that uh, that part of the reason the world's going crazy uh, is because essentially we're running this giant experiment on on social dynamics through social media that we have these incredibly powerful tools that we haven't had in the past that are designed to capture our attention and essentially they're designed to capture our attention largely by by um by manipulating negative emotion because negative emotion tends to be uh more more powerful, right? So if you want someone to pay attention to something, uh, they're, they're, they will usually pay more attention if it, if it triggers a negative emotion. Yeah, you can get someone to hate you in a second. It might take you years to get them to love you. <laughs> right? you, can, and, you, can, you can break trust in a second. It takes a long time to build trust. So the, yeah, the negative emotions have a much quicker feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And there's something uh, inherently satisfying or uh, engaging right about the experience of, uh, of righteous anger and so we have we have essentially thrown gasoline onto political polarization through social media and we also have the capacity to manufacture information and information that looks like high quality information um, but is in fact misinformation at a rate that is, you know, unlike anything that's ever been in the past, right? So if you want to make a compelling scientific looking case that anything is true, uh, you have a better ability to do that. Um, and people who want to mislead have a better set of tools to sort of make something look authoritative than has ever existed in the past. Uh, and yeah. Uh, we have a, I think we have a deeply poisoned information ecology. Right. And again, one of the things um, I've been talking to a, a friend of mine who, um, who lives in Southeast Louisiana, I grew up in the bayou about um, the dangers of sort of polarization and alternative facts and fake news on people who, who live in the real world, who, who engage in the world with motor skills and are un, like, you know, if you step on a rock and the rock isn't steady, it'll give you feedback. Like you can't, the, the real world won't lie to you. And so, you know, one of, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is that you're this, you know, a, a guide and a teacher of bringing our bodies back into contact with the real world. And, yeah. you know, I could see it's sort of an antidote for that, but also like, you know, a, a path back to humanity. Cause you know, there's, there's, meta, there's so many layers between us and our environment, which I think based on any, any sort of thing I understand about systems theory is like if, if we aren't in contact with our ecosystem, then we're false somehow, we're, we're, we're corrupted. So, yeah. You know, I interrupted you and you were about to talk about um, martial arts. So maybe we should, you know, I'd love to get back to <laughs> your, <laughs> your journey of physicality and what, what we can learn from it and what, you're, what you want to tell the world and share. Yeah, um, 
<laughs> at some point I remember thinking I'm bringing human back, right? You know that song by uh, by Justin Timberlake, I'm bringing sexy back, right? I'm bringing human back. That's that's the idea. And so you know my tagline is like move like a human being, right? Move like a human. And and that can be confusing for people because the idea is like, well, duh, I'm always moving like a human being. I am a human, right? Everything that I do is moving like a human. Um, but you know, you can use a knife as a screwdriver, but it doesn't work very well for the knife, right? It's not sustainable over time. Yeah. Right? Uh, the knife isn't a very effective screwdriver and it tends to break the knife. And in the same sense, I believe that a human being has a niche. It has a it has a, a history of what it's adapted to evolutionarily. And that when it, and that the things that, unlike a knife or a screwdriver, um, we respond to the work that we're put under, right? And we, we grow through it. So for us, physical work is a nourishment. Um, and the physical work that we evolved with is, uh, is what our body adapted to being nourished by. And when we miss out on that, I believe it's the same as when we miss out on critical um, chemical nutrients. In fact, I think that chemical nutrition and physical nutrition are much more similar than people realize. And here I'm very influenced by Katie Bowman's work. But if you look at the cellular signaling pathways, you can see that, that, you, that when you remove a motor stimulus uh, from somebody's life, you get similar changes in the chemical paths, uh, uh, chemical signaling um, as when you remove uh, a physical or a, a chemical, right? So you can give someone osteoporosis by denying them calcium, or you can give someone osteoporosis by denying them bone loading, right? It's the same, same end output, right? You can atrophy a muscle by denying somebody food, or you can atrophy a muscle by denying someone movement, right? If you, uh, if you cast someone's legs for six weeks, right? Their legs look like someone who just had, got out of a concentration camp. The, these things happen the same way. And I think we don't recognize to what degree the, the ill health that we are experiencing um, physically, um, but not just physically, is due to essentially a, a mismatch between the motor nutrition, the movement nutrition that we are evolved for and the movement nutrition that we experience. But I think that it's deeper than that. I think that we go back to the idea at the beginning that our cognition is actually rooted in, in physical and motor skills that we can't actually fully develop ourselves as cognitive and emotional agents without interfacing through the body. And that when we don't have a, a good relationship with the body, when we don't have a fully uh, embodied set of skills were actually um, we are we are cut off from a ma major aspect of ourselves, right? Uh, I actually think Nietzsche was kind of a prophet about this, and I need to read him more deeply. But you know, he has this image in Thus Spake to Zarathustra, I believe, of the intellectual as this atrophied body with a giant ear, mm. and I think we're all kind of that, right? We are we are uh, we are, we're taking in information all the time, and then we are not acting that information out in our body. And so we are atrophying these things that connect us. And this is a, this is a beautiful, like I, I've been um, in communication a lot with John Bervakey, who's uh, the director of cognitive science at uh, the University of Toronto. And he has an amazing series of lectures on YouTube called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And in them, he talks about uh, four ways of knowing, right? We, we have uh, propositional knowing. Propositional knowing is essentially semantic representation, right? Uh, so you can, you can know how to, you know, you can go on Wikipedia and you can just gobble up propositional information about whatever it is that you want. Um, but it's not the same as actually knowing how to do something. So I can, I can tell you Propositional knowing is like why I got A's in school. Sure. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, unless it was shop class, right? But uh, but if it was represented, I didn't get A's in shop class. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I I recognize this. Like, I my dad is an extraordinary builder, right? My brother was a master carpenter when he was 
uh, 18 years old and he's an engineer now, right? Mm -hmm. So I have these two men in my life who, uh, who can make anything they want with their hands, right? And I'm more articulate with words than either of them. Both of them are very smart, but, uh, but I'm more skilled with words, let's say. And so people will recognize that I'm intelligent um, faster, right? They'll say, oh man, you know, you, you, you know, you're so smart, but, but it's not that useful <laughs> sometimes, right? Like I, I was like, you know, um, who do you want with you in the zombie apocalypse? And I was like, oh, well, I would choose my brother over me, yeah. right? My brother knows how to make things and get things done and coordinate people in making things. Right. If you want something built, if you want something, you know, he's, he's got the skills. Um, he has the intelligence in his body. Right. He had, you know, he understands engineering, which is, you know, very cognitively in uh, intense. And then he can map it to what it feels like to build something. Right. He can, he can imagine the tensions on these objects because he's built so many things. And so, so yeah, so you have, Propositional, which is you know, uh, which is like a semantic representation. And then you have procedural, which is, which is how it's played out, right? So I can say to you, to do a Kong vault, you have to, you know, dive off both feet, catch with both hands, and pass your your legs in between your uh, your arms, right? And and you can have a perfect semantic representation. And I could give it to you in way more detail than that, but it's not necessary here. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can do it, right? Uh, so that the being able to do it is, is procedural. And then the next level is the perspectival. The perspectival is um, what does the world look like to someone who can do that, right? So a, a good illustration of that is if I take you through that Kong ball and I teach you how to do it and you do it in a gym, do you actually see how the world outside of the gym affords you the capacity to do it, right? Or another good example would be in the martial arts. I can teach you how to punch and I can teach you how to punch in the air, like a traditional kata, or I can teach you how to punch on a heavy bag. Um, the heavy bag, in my opinion, is a much better tool, but it still doesn't mean that you can actually punch another person who's trying to punch you. Because in order to actually be able to punch you, you have to be able to perceive when in, an envir in a dynamic environment between you and another player or another, an opponent, there's the opportunity to punch and not be punched back. Right? And that only that perspective, that perspectival knowledge of when you can punch and not be punched back can only be gained through fighting. Right. right? Yeah, or even what, what it will what their body will feel like against your knuckles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the participatory is kind of what changes within you through having gone through that process. Like who who are you knowing by being? What is it to be the fighter? How does that change you? What is it to be the, 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 the parkour athlete? What is it to be the engineer? Um, the way that I like to think about it is that a good, an analogy I like is, is you, you could say that a mother should breastfeed her, her children, right? And that's a semantic rule, right? It's a rule. And then, uh, then there's actually, it's not so easy. You actually have to figure out how to do it. Right, what's the procedure of doing? How do you hold the baby? How do you understand the latch? How do you get the mouth to open correctly? And all these things. Um, and that's, that's a routine. Um, and then there's a perspectival level that every mother shares. What is it? What is the salience landscape of a mother who has to pay attention to feeding her child? But then every child and every mother have a unique experience of, of, of what that relationship of going through the breastfeeding process is and how that transforms them and in relationship to each other. And that's the participatory level. So um, in some sense, you could say that, that propositional gives us, uh, um, gives us rules. Procedural gives us routines. Perspectival uh, gives us a role, right? You're playing the role of the mother. And then the participatory is the level of the individual relationship and the transformation. And so, the reason that I bring this up and it's such an important, I think it's such an important concept is that we are searching for meaning. We have a sense in our culture that life is inherently meaningless and that we have some sort of nihilism that's deep in our culture. Mm -hmm. And I think people don't realize that that's kind of unique historically to Western uh, 
post-scientific enlightenment culture. And it, it actually, I think it's actually derivative of the worldview of scientific materialism, rational materialism. Because in order to, to look at the world objectively, we actually have to strip those other layers out, right? Those ways of knowing, right? I cannot, I cannot write a scientific paper about doing parkour that can impart to you anything about perspectival or procedural or, or, or participatory aspect of having been in it, right? Not, not on any level. And, <clears throat> you know, that's the realm of, you know, poetry and music, which so, can, yeah, yeah. can sort of get it, you know, can impart it, can it know, right? It can evoke, but it can't, it can only go so far. It's like a lot of things you have to actually have done, you have to actually do it. And, and so the reason that Nietzsche has this image of the, of the, of the intellectual is the intellectual becomes addicted to the propositional knowledge, to acquiring it. And, and they don't recognize that they're only, they're only feeding one of the four layers. And as a culture, we are that intellectual, right? We are that giant ear. And when we, when we become addicted to our, our devices, a lot of what we're experiencing is, is, being, is being drowned in addictive information that exists only at that level, mm -hmm. right? And so it's habit forming to be on Twitter. But it's not, it doesn't actually bring meaning into life because it's within, this is, this is you know, the point of Verbeke. He had a beautiful talk at a, a, a summit that we put on. And you know, he essentially makes the case that the mindfulness revolution and the movement revolution, and the embodiment revolution, they, they all come together because in order to recover the sense of meaning and in order to recover, uh, um, yeah, in order to recover our humanity in some sense, we have to remember these lost ways of knowing. We have to remember the procedural perspective and participatory. We have to rebuild selves that are fully fleshed out on all of these levels. Um, and that I think is where my work connects with his work and, and with you know, the work of other people talking about meaning with John, uh, Jordan Peterson and um, whomever they are, uh, because I think that we need practices that take us all the way back into the body and not just into the body, but into the natural world. We have to be in communication with the environment and in community. Um, and John is part of a theory, uh, part of a camp within cognitive science um, or a school of cognitive science, let's say called 4E CogSci. And 4E CogSci says essentially the cognition inherently has to be embodied, embedded, enacted and extended, right? Well, this, these are the elements of a cognition that allow it to function. So embodied. So this is a really, this is a fascinating thing that came out with the cybernetics revolution. Um, it's very hard to get a, um, a computer to recognize that these are both cups. That these are both cups and that this is not a cup. Yeah. So, you know, this is cylindrical and that is cylindrical. But this is not cylindrical, right? Um, this is glass, this is ceramic, this is metal. Like there are so many things that 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 could be salient in how we recognize something. Um, so it turns out a cup is a category that arises from the motivations and the motor capacities of a human being. Right? A cup is relevant to us because we have a motivation to drink and we have a capacity for grasping. So a cup becomes an object that has high salience to us and has a meaning that derives from that. Um, and it's actually really hard to train a computer to recognize that meaning. And in fact, the best way to train a computer to recognize that meaning is to give a computer a hand or a, 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 a machine that it controls that delivers water from one place to another. And then it can quickly start to recognize which things allow that action to take place. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like training deep blue to play chess, right? The, the latest, uh, you know, the closest to general AI is just give it the rules and let's let it play a zillion games of chess and it'll teach itself. Have to play, have to play the game. So, so cognition, so we, um, our cognition is embodied and in, in our category schema is related 
absolutely at the deepest level to, um, and we can't get out of it, is to having uh, a set of physical embodied motivational motivations and a set of physical embodied motor capacities. Right? And that's why the analogy aspect that we talked about earlier is really important. So, um, so that's embodied. Embedded means that we, we are within an environment, right? This, this, is, this is the environment. It's, it's, uh, our cognition is not meaningful except in the fact that it's, it allows us to interrelate to an environment around us. And so we can't understand ourselves by only thinking what's in here. We have to also understand ourselves by understanding what this is inside of the environment. Um, and then we, we also can't understand ourselves without actually acting things out. That's enacted. And the last part is extended, which is to say that we are part of a network of minds, of other human minds. But even beyond that, we're a network of, of other minds in general. You can tune into what the birds are, how the birds are behaving. And the bird, the, the net mind of the birds informs you about the state of the environment around you. So, so, so cognition is extended. So when we, when we spend all of our lives in front of a screen arguing on Twitter, we are, uh, yes, we are embedded in this environment, the, the, the screen, and we are facilitated by our capacity to type, but we are experiencing a very small section of that, that full capacity, right? And so what my work does with Evolve Move Play is essentially it, it brings us back into fully relating to all of those levels of cognition, right? And the way that we've thought about that before we, we ran into this is uh, these are the essential kind of nutrients of the human being, the, the, the reconnections that we crave in order to actually have meaning in life. We have to reconnect to our bodies, right? We have to move away from being intellectual and thus like Zarathustra. Um, and we have to reconnect with the natural world and just the world in general. Um, and we have to reconnect with, uh, with our capacity to move and we have to reconnect with, with other human beings. And it's, it's within that, that we'll actually be able to recover a sense of meaning in the world. Yeah, so when you talk about, you know, movement um, stimuli as like literal nutrients that we yeah. need just as much as chemicals, like, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people around physical activity and, you know, as a country, we, we understand we should move but you know, I should be in the gym, I should be on the treadmill, I should be lifting those weights in this particular way. It's almost like it's, you know, we're trying to create the you know, soylent exercise. Like just, you know, what are, what are the, um, you know, either the minimum effective dose or something that's very, very organized, routinized and sanitized. And you know, I'm on your website now, it says like, here's the list of things that you teach people to do running, jumping, climbing, manipulating objects, cooperating with others and roughhousing yeah. in a natural environment. Like what, what do we gain from that that we don't get from pumping iron or, or you know, watching CNN while on a treadmill? Well, we're, we, we're moving like human beings and we're connecting all those things that I just mentioned because to go back to the beginning of our conversation, the treadmill you know, bicep curl, leg extension, you know, ab machine uh, model is a model that's derived from thinking of a human being as a machine, right? So, you know, you have to, you have to train the cardiovascular system and the muscular system and flexibility, and you have to train the different muscle groups. Um, and it doesn't work very well. And it doesn't work very well on a number of different levels. It doesn't work very, very particularly well in actually producing people who are athletic or fit. Um, you know, this is something that, you know, has been recognized for quite some time is that strength that's built in the gym often has lower transfer and sort of is less robust than the strength that's built through more traditional activities. Uh, in the team sport world, people have, spoken for a long time about the idea of farm farm boy strong versus gym strong so if you know if you test an athlete at the combine and he jumps higher and pushes more weight around and runs faster um, than everybody else 
that doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be effective on the field. There's all these workout warriors who came in and performed super well and then blew up and were not effective. But what they've, what a lot of scouts seem to have felt over the years is that if someone performs well at those tasks, not because they've trained for them specifically, but because of the, because they develop that strength through other aspects of their life, um, then they'll, they'll transfer it better to the field. So, and I can explain why I believe that's true. So that's one aspect of it. But the other aspect of it that's more important to most people is that it doesn't work because people won't do it because it's miserable and absolutely a dreadful experience because a human being isn't a machine and we don't enjoy being treated like machines. So most people's experience of running on a treadmill uh, is that it's terrible and drudgerous and the only way that they get through it is by watching CNN, which um, it's not such a good thing for you. Uh, but a lot of people find that they enjoy running through the woods or cross-country skiing or snowshoeing because that puts them in a relationship with nature. Mm. That gives them variability and change. Mm. So, yeah, so, but one of the things I discovered about like being out in nature is like, yeah, it's fun and it's interesting, but it's also uncomfortable and it can be mm. itchy and cold and wet. And, <laughs> you know, when I was, you know, training with, with Glenn Murphy of it's Sistema, like we do these things where like on purpose, we're supposed to make ourselves uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. like, like that was, you know, I was like, gee, maybe, maybe the treadmill's not so bad. Like here I am like developing, you know, rashes and stuff. Like what's, yeah. what's the, is there value in discomfort in, in nature? Absolutely. Um, there's comfort and meaning are not well aligned, right? And ultimately, we are, we are more satisfied by life when our life is highly meaningful. So there's a very strange phenomenon, in my opinion, that, um, that a lot of the most profound things you'll experience, the things that, that, have, that have continued meaning for you and they give you a sense of satisfaction are very uncomfortable in the moment, right? Or they require you to go through a period of, of of sort of accommodating yourself to discomfort, right? So when you first start running, it doesn't matter whether you're indoors or outdoors. If you've been sedentary for a period of time, like as your heart rate bumps up and lactic acid builds up in your muscles and all these things happen, it's uncomfortable and it's, it feels threatening to your body. But there's this weird thing that happens, which is that when you overcome that, all of a sudden it becomes a source of deep joy, right? Like your body rewards you for doing it. You, if you, if you go through the first few weeks or however long it takes to adapt yourself to a physical task like running, um, like running in particular, you get um, the runner's high, right? So your body dumps opioids and endocannabinoids into your brain to tell you, good job. Thanks for doing that, right? That, that was relevant to you evolutionarily for a long time. So we're going to reward you for it. Um, Children have an inherent drive to test their edges and to do things that are uncomfortable for them in a sense. And we have a motivational system around that of play and play makes you, you know, you feel good when you're playing. Play is, is a deeply rewarding state, but people tend to remember play as children in a way that's a little bit unrealistic. They think that it's sort of like that all the time, but children are constantly going through frustrations and fears and discomforts as they're seeking that, that, that moment of play. And it's true. It's true in whatever we do, right? Like if you're a skier, you're going to experience feeling cold, right? You're going to experience huffing and puffing and, you know, your muscles being achy and sore. And then you're going to experience moments of sublime joy as you carve down the mountain and you are in a state of absolute flow and you don't get one without the other, right? So, uh, you know, Ido Portal said all the best games have a high cost of entry. Hmm. Right? And so if you if your goal is to is to not have to bear those costs, then you're going to be playing a life that is is um, denuded of its most powerful colors, the most beautiful colors. Right? It's sort of like 
like saying like, is it worth the discomfort of engaging in physical practice? To me, that's like saying, is it worth the discomfort of falling in love? Because I'm like, being in love is deeply uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. Having children is deeply uncomfortable. It's like the meaningful shit in life doesn't just like show up and, you know, wrap you in a, in a comforter and say, okay, you know, have some hot chocolate and everything's going to be perfect, right? It's like, no, like you got to show up for it. Which isn't to say that we always should be in that state of yang, right? Like pushing, striving, you know, being uncomfortable, you know. Uh, that's one of the beautiful things about me, high checks and Holly's work, right? It's like, if you're, if you, if you adopt that idea that, that it's always on your edge, that you're going to, to find the most profound things. If you go too far into your edge, you're just in a constant state of anxiety, mm -hmm. right? You have to find that, that optimal zone of challenge. And that is where we find life is most profound and meaningful. Now, one, one thing I wonder about, and I'm, um, I'm saying this to someone who's fairly ignorant of like the, the depth of, of other cultures, of hunter-forager cultures, but like when I think about like our mo you know, biological motivations, it's basically, you know, go along with the crowd because that's the safest thing to do. You know, it's, it's a good algorithm usually. Um, and rest when you can, of, you know, seek pleasure, avoid pain. And the reason that we have evolved for discomfort is we didn't have a choice, right? Like you wanted to eat, you had to go run. If you, and you had to go you know, chase things and kill things and not get killed by other things. And the reason we have all these motivations to like rest and chase pleasure is because we had to, right? And now we live in a world, this artificial world where I can be comfortable 24 seven. My, my thermostat set at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It's warm, it's sunny, the wind's blowing like crazy. I have glass panes that protect me from it. That now it feels like very unnatural for humans to choose to suffer willingly, to choose discomfort. Mm -hmm. uh, but is, you know, I don't know if that's true. I mean, I'm imagining there were, you know, in every society, there was an impulse to say, okay, let's, let's push things a little. Yeah, I believe so. Um, and the first thing that comes up is play. Right, because children don't see comfort so much, right? Like they do, but they're also always seeking their edges. And people people choose all these different recreational activities because they take us to our edges and they're deeply enjoyable, right? Whether it's parkour, martial arts, skateboarding, snowboarding, yoga, running, right? Like there's a lot of a lot of human beings, actually, who, who are choosing that, right? and a lot of us aren't. So why why do some people not choose it? Um, I think there's probably multiple reasons for that, but part of it is I actually think that we are conditioned, we are punished for that inherent play drive, right? Mm. And this is my problem, this is my central critique of physical culture and what I'm trying to change about physical culture in a lot of ways. This is why the brand is called Evolve and Play. Um, we, we try to motivate people to engage in exercise by shaming them about their body, right? Mm -hmm. Or by motivating them through this sort of abstract idea of health. And it turns out that neither of these are particularly effective motivators and they can actually be quite pernicious, right? The the training for the body beautiful seems to uh, set many people up for uh, body image disorders, right? And I'm not, I'm not saying there's no, no utility to aesthetics or that beauty isn't something worth pursuing, but I'm saying that when we, that we've made that central to our physical culture in a way that seems to be psychologically damaging to many people and is failing to actually deliver the benefits of exercise to 90% of the population, right? So, so that's not working, but what we know works, at least in some populations, or what seems to work the best in almost every population that I've looked at is play. And if we think about hunter forager populations and we think about animals, um, they do exercise uh, when sufficiently rested and sufficiently well fed, they engage in play. And the more intelligent and more social an animal is, the more it is intrinsically driven to play. So 
when hunter foragers have been well fed and they um, are rested, they play, they dance, they wrestle, they climb trees, they set up games. And there's, there's tons of beautiful games that are found you know, culturally, you know, just crazy variations of games all over. And often there's an element of religion as well, right, where people are, are viewing this as a form of worship, but it's also playful. So there's, there, it's not so simple as this idea that we, we don't exercise just because we're inherently lazy, right? Um, that's maybe part of the truth. Um, we have a capacity to be inherently lazy, but we also have deep drives for play and for, for self-transcendence and growth and for challenging ourselves. And the thing is that we put children in a chair and we sit them down for eight hours a day and when they engage in play, we punish them for being physically active. And so we are deconditioning them from engaging in the very motivational pathway that is uh, the most, I believe it's the most stable way to get people to engage in exercise. But more than that, it's also the most educational and most nourishing of the human, of the overarching human being, right? So, if we want to understand why people don't exercise, we have to understand that we are using the wrong motivations and we are inherently in, and we are, in, we are systematically inhibiting the motivational system that actually gets people moving. So can, 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 we, um, can we close this by having you talk directly to my audience who are, let's, let's, I'll give you a, uh, a segment of them that I really want to hear this, which is, you know, people who have not been that active, they're yeah. not, you know, they're, they're, they want to be in better health. That's why they're here. That's why they're listening to us. Um, they might be doing some walking or a little bit of weight training, but basically like they've just had it with the pandemic. They're, they're struggling and the thought of adding more challenge to their life just feels horrible. Mm -hmm. And yet they want to feel better. They want to be healthy. They want to have a better mood. Like, where, what are the steps? And obviously, I'd love for you to tell people like where where they can go and they would download your your free fifteen day course and all that. But but just sort of generally, like talk to those people who think that what you're talking about, you know, parkour, roughhousing, running in nature, climbing trees, um, juggling, all that stuff is so far out of reach. It's you you might as well be talking a different language. Yeah. So first I would ask them to try to remember the joy that they had in physical play as a child and to recognize that, that they didn't grow out of it. You know, that that's, that's not just a stage in your life that can be, that is left behind, but it's something that our culture in many ways has killed for them and that they can recover it. And that there's lots of people like myself who are, you know, almost 40 years old or older who are engaging with it and finding it incredibly meaningful. And it doesn't have to look like jumping from one tree branch to another 30 feet off the ground or, you know, doing any of these things that look so scary and intimidating, right? We do those things because they're very joyful and they're very powerful and they tend to attract a lot of attention, um, which makes it easy for, to get an opportunity to speak like this. But the truth is that most, most people who hear this never need to try a lot of the things that I do. Um, but they can still have movement journeys that are incredibly meaningful to them and that can change their lives in many, many positive ways. What they need to do in order to get that is they have to start recognizing what actually brings them joy that's physical. If, they're, if what you ask yourself to do in the physical realm is always associated with drudgery or punishment or you know, negative self-image, it's going to be very hard to sustain it over time. And even if you can sustain it over time, it won't necessarily improve your life. You know, you can be abusing yourself. You can be breaking yourself down through motivating something like this through self-hatred. So treat yourself like somebody that you care deeply about and say, what, what is the physical movement that would bring me into a state of play or a state of joy or a state of engagement with the environment that would be rewarding for me. And for a lot of people, the best place to start is a walk, right? Just a walk in nature. And then 
start to pay attention to the natural world, start to tune into it. You know, I think bird languages is a really beautiful thing to study and to start bring us into connection with the natural world. Mm. And then, you know, find a way to engage with other people, maybe physically that is really engaging for you. So it can be ballroom dance, it can be Zumba. People in the fitness community love to hate on Zumba, but it makes people happy <laughs> and it gets, and that's freaking great, right? And it's, it's not a complete movement nutrient from like making sure all your tissues are great, but but if it gets you started feeling really happy about moving, start there, right? You have to, I believe that the, the cornerstone, the thing that you need to build off of in your physical practice has to be something that brings you into a state of love and how you engage with it. So ask yourself, what, what do you love? Um, Paul Check, one of my mentors and friends, he, he has the same like the, your, your training, your programming, the way that you think about your life, it has to be rooted around this question. What is the one thing that you love enough to create change? So whatever you're asking yourself to do, it's like, what do I love so much that I'm willing to change how I behave in order to get more of it? Hmm. And, uh, yeah, and we're, and we're really good at that around, you know, cookies and Netflix. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh yeah, you'll spend your life to be able to binge watch your show. Yeah, like, um, we, like we have the, we have the model for mm -hmm. I'm going to change my life to get more of this, but we just you know so so few of us um, are in touch with the experience of movement as one of those things as as like a true nutrient. And, and not yeah, we don't covering it up. Yeah, we don't recognize that it is a place where we can experience that, right? Yeah. Or that's available to us, or we see that it's only we think that it's only for you know, people who look like superheroes or people who are young and fit, people who are male or people who, you know, whatever, right? Um, our models are, are often, you know, uh, young, sexy people. Um, you know, our models for, for, for the kind of more intense physical practices I like to do are, are mostly male too. But what we find is that it doesn't matter, right? you can have a 70 year old come out, try it out. They can be overweight, right? And they can, they can still tap into the same joy they had as a child by getting physical with another person, by being able to vault over a log, by being able to jump into water in nature. And, and when they tap into that, it's, um, it's, it's, it's incredible to see it, to see people recognize that it's there for them, right? That they can have that and that, Unfortunately, I think more children are being raised without ever really experiencing it. But if you're 60 years old right now, you probably had it when you were 10, right? You know, you know what that meant. And when you find that you still get to have it when you're 60, um, I've seen this look on people's face over and over again. Like it's, it's like, you know, I guess it's coming home again in a way, right? It's coming home again to something really profound and really, really rewarding that you somehow forgot that you had access to. And I'm just trying to remind people that they, they, it's still there mm. and you can't get it, no matter who you are. And you'll like it when you do. Beautiful. Would you, can we t take us out by um, telling us how people can find you? And yeah. And, and learn from you. Yeah, so my website's evolvemoveplay.com and then you can find Evolve, move, play, all one word, dot com. Okay. Yeah, and um, we have a 30-day uh, foundation program to get people started moving. It includes mindfulness and movement lifestyle and basic physical practices that you can do. Uh, and give, you know, when you buy into it, you get access to our online academy. Um, you get access to all the forums. We have a really dedicated community of practitioners all uh, posting regularly, talking and supporting each other. We have uh, weekly calls where we touch in with students and uh, have discussions about all these things that we're talking about today. Um, and you can find that, uh, I think actually the easiest place to find it right now, I need to kind of revamp my website a little bit. The easiest place to find it right now is on via my Instagram, which is Ray Kelly at Instagram. You just click the, the special offer right now. We have a special offer up. Um, but yeah, it should be on the website. We'll, we'll get the website uh, fixed up and, and get the offer clear uh, in the next couple of weeks. And um, 
you can always email me at rafe at evolvemoveplay.com if you have questions or want to get involved. Okay, that's uh, K-E-L-L-E. Yeah, K-E-L-L-E-Y. Mm -hmm. um, K-E-L-L-E-Y. But rafe at evolvemoveplay.com is good. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, uh, a lot of great content on our YouTube. We have our own podcast. Uh, you can check that out as well. Uh, amazing conversations with, with uh, some pretty pretty profound people. So um, give it a try. And I'll put, I'll put links to that in the show notes so people can can find all that stuff. Um, wow, this we we covered we covered so many philosophical fundamentals. You know, I yeah. kind of, we were going to talk about like you know jumping over logs, and we did. But I love I love the depth and the thought that you put into like what what is this and what does it mean to be human and and what are we missing out by by short circuiting that so uh, I appreciate I appreciate the uh, the level one intellectual um, yeah. part and now I I'm I'm really uh, inspired to go out and you know chop some wood and do do some of the stuff I've been avoiding because it's been cold and. Uh, yeah. So I encourage cold. you. To... Wim Hof says, cold is a warm friend. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I'm doing a lot of the cold bathing right now. And, you know, it's not it's not a pleasant experience when you are in the, in it, at least right now. But most of the time, my mood is substantially elevated afterwards. And going out and chopping wood in the cold, I think is going to do the same thing for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, you know, I'm doing the, the Sistema douse in the morning, either cold shower or cold bucket or jumping in. And, and but the, the best thing about it is that for almost all of the day, I'm not doing it. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but powerful medicine, that one. You don't have to do it all the time. Uh, Rafe Kelly, thank you so much for taking the time today and for all you do to help us become more, more fully human, more fully embodied, and more fully connected. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Howie. It was a pleasure to speak with you. Take care. Bye-bye.